Hello and welcome to another Hill and Pond video blog. I'm Matthew Hill. I'm here with Carol Ponton and Carrie Baker. Today we would like to talk to you about some of the changes we've seen in the new appeal process, the Appeals Modernization Act, that uh, we are seeing uh, are leading to pit pitfalls for, for vets we represent. Uh, first to kind of frame it, I think we should discuss the legacy appeals. And Carrie, would you tell us, you know, it used to be that, uh, you know, the, the, the old saying was a vet could put something on a napkin and open a claim, and they, in the legacy system, they did, they did kind of bind that down, and what, what do they do to that? And, and by legacy, know? Matt, just to be clear, legacy is what we were dealing with the last, I don't know how many years. It Decades. just changed recently. Yeah. Right. So the so in the legacy process, you're right. You used to can submit just about any claim you wanted as long as it was in writing and delivered to VA, uh, with the exception of one thing, and one thing that stayed steady throughout this whole time, and that was the original claim. Uh, okay. VA has always required uh, VA Form 21-526 for the original claim. In it, both in the legacy process as well as the current AMA process. But once, and sticking to the legacy process, once you had submitted a 526, uh, at some point, you could then submit a second claim, be it a reopening of one that was previously denied, an increased rating claim, a new service connection claim, on multiple things, on a 4138, which is basically a blank VA form, kind of like notebook paper. You could use actual notebook paper. Uh, you could call in to VA. I mean, as long as it was recorded somewhere, you had a valid claim pending. Uh, a few years ago, uh, they before, decided- Before the AMA, a few years before ago. The right? AM, right, before the AMA. Um, and one of the problems with, Claims like that is that you know raiders had to decipher uh, three, four, five, six page letters uh, that were sometimes hard to read, and mm -hmm. they would miss claims. You know, you just, you just it's just going to happen. Uh, just human nature. So a few years ago, VA decided to still in the legacy process make uh, certain forms mandatory, so that when VA gets a claim in, they they know the form that it should be on. They can see right what the veteran's claiming uh, and and go from there. Now, not everything had a mandatory form, uh, just like not everything does now, but most things do. If you were going to file a claim, either an original, an increased rating, uh, a reopen claim, you pretty much had to use uh, their specified form. Most of that could have been done in the legacy process on uh, a 526. Now, for a while there, they had different kinds of 526s. They had short versions, longer versions. Uh, they had the easy version. As long as you had it on one of those, you were good to go and you had a valid claim in the system. Uh, so that's that's really the the, the legacy cl you know claim requirement in a nutshell uh, as far as the forms you needed. Well, and, and then the appeal. Uh, in the legacy system, basically it was you file a claim. If, if you don't get everything you'd like, you file a notice of disagreement, NOD. Again, if, if you are still unsatisfied, you'd file a VA Form 9 or an appeal to the uh, Board of Veterans Appeals. The VA believed that was too complicated, so they made this new system. Uh, but once in the old system, the legacy, you filed that original claim that, or the claim for increase on 526, you filed then the NOD, which I think had its own special form, Carrie, remember? Right. Going back, way back, uh, when you could, you know, when you just needed that first 526 before anything was mandatory, uh, you just needed to express some form of disagreement in a decision. It could be on a letter of 4138, you know, call into VA, uh, but just like mandating forms a few years ago, they decided to make a specific notice of disagreement form. Uh, and this is again, prior to AMA, like you said. And so it was just one form, uh, it was not multiple forms. So if you disagreed with a decision, it allowed you to identify that decision, identify the issues and send that to VA. And that was your notice of disagreement. It was the same process, just a mandatory form and it wasn't really a complicated form. Okay. And then again, once you, go if, if you disagree with that next decision at the regional office you would go to the board of veterans appeals va right. form nine but you didn't have to use the va form nine right you, you had to uh, 
you could do the form nine or a written statement in lieu of a VA form nine. You just had to substantiate your appeal to the board. Uh, the board would accept a statement or the form nine itself. Some people would do both, um, mm -hmm. you know, but they, there was no element in VA looking to nitpick those things apart and, and then tell the veteran, uh, oh, sorry, we're, we can't process your case because, you know, this minor issue or this major right. issue. So and then we flash forward to post February 19th, so 2019. With the advent of the Appeals Modernization Act, February 2019, everything's changed. Um, now, I, I, let me rephrase that. Almost everything's changed. You still have to file your initial claim on uh, 526. Now, before I get into any further than that, you know, let me try to explain what the forms are and, and jump in if I miss anything, Matt or Carol. Um, so you've got the 526 still, okay, for original claims. You have supplemental claims, which is a, uh, a 20 0995. You have a higher level review request, which is a 20 0996. You have an appeal to the board, directly to the board, uh, which is a uh, VA form 10182. Okay. And to just uh, just to catch you off there, uh, there there isn't a test after this on, on the names <laughs> of the forms, but we will put links on them to on the uh, the, the notes here because it it is overwhelming. Okay. Uh, but Carrie's Car Car kind of laying it out what, what all is there. And so that now. The one thing the AMA did about the appellate process that uh, from the legacy process, it, it more or less eliminated that old NOD form that the uh, VA had, was using for a short period of time. So now it's the it's one of these forms. So with the advent of you know just just looking at the forms you would file at the regional office, okay, five two six, the uh, supplemental claim. Or the higher level review is really more like an appeal. Um, and of course the board, uh, the, the appeal uh, using the 101-1182 form is an appeal to the board. Um, but let's, let me talk about just about the 526 and the supplemental claim for now, because that's typically what people are gonna use when they try to, re try to open an original claim at the regional office or reopen a claim uh, at the regional office. When all of this started, we thought uh, you could use a supplemental claim uh, to either reopen an old claim or uh, file service connection on a new claim. We also thought because they still had the 526, you could try to reopen a claim on that. You know, and in the scenario, uh, and I and I'll I'll tell it myself here. Uh, this is a learning experience for me. I still don't disagree. I still disagree with VA on it, but you know they've they've got the lead here, uh, and that's if you have been denied something, say ten years ago, uh, you know, and you want to try to reopen that, you would typically file that on a five two six. I would think under the new process because all of the new forms that come under the AMA were some form of what they call decision review request, and in every scenario. If you're going to make a decision review request, you had to file that form within a year of the decision that you wanted VA to review. Just like in the legacy process, you had to submit an NOD within a year of the decision that you want VA to review on appeal. Same thing here, okay? So on that mindset, a lot of people would look at a reopen claim from 10 years ago as uh, something you would use uh, a, a, a 526 for because you're not asking for a decision review that's occurred within the last year. So it would just make kind of common sense. And you're not appealing anything. And you're not appealing anything. And that took a lot of us by surprise. It took me by surprise. I can't speak for other advocates. Um, that they started kicking those claims back, saying, "No, you got to file them on a on a, on a supplemental claim." And I, so I would communicate with VA try and try to tell them, "Look, I'm not asking for a decision review. This this case has not been touched. This issue for ten years. So there is no decision within the last year that I can ask you to review. I'm just trying to reopen an old claim." Uh, VA's instructions that they put out, you know, as to which of those forms to use, 
really didn't tell us. Um, and so we started getting a lot of letters from claims that we put 526s on telling us that uh, th those aren't valid claims and the VA is not going to do anything with, uh, with those claims and they would send out a letter and it would, it would say very vague uh, information. And uh, well, we don't want to get into the letters yet. I'm guessing, Matt, I'm still trying to lay out the groundwork for uh, uh, how we got to where we are. But, but that's when we, that's when I first started seeing the, the letters that were rejecting things is when you would file a 526 or try to reopen something from years past be able to send a letter out and this is uh, invalid. We're not going to take any action on your claim. Uh, and well, Carrie, real quick, talk about, um, we don't have to talk about the claim form, but, the, but yeah. just the su supplemental claim. And is that one, what, what does that mean? Is that good, one good, thing, two things? Good point. I think I was uh, starting to uh, get into loose ends there. Um, so a supplemental claim now uh, we know is any, uh, any claim that's been denied in the past, whether it's in the past year or 20 or 30 years ago, uh, it has to go now on a supplemental claim form. Uh, so you're, you're trying to reopen uh, in a previous claim. The same goes for increased rating claims. You know, say, and this is another part we thought the 526 was generally appropriate for. Uh, the vet's been service connected for a back condition for 20 years and he wants to file an increased rating, uh, typically you'd come in with a 526. Now you have to use the supplemental claim form, the 0995 right. to do that uh, because they're calling it a supplemental claim even though the form itself is, is titled decision review request supplemental claim. There is no decision within the past year in that scenario that, that VA can review. You're just reopening an, uh, a previous claim. So you got to know the distinction there uh, when you're filing one of these. Is that, right. that kind of answer seem, You're right. It, it doesn't seem to make sense, but they're looking, has this claim been filed before? And if you filed a claim for your back before and the next time, and it's not currently under appeal, you know, you have to use that 0995. Mm -hmm. so, so, so Kara, let's, let's step ahead there then. If you, if you have filed that claim, or you, you file the claim in a supplemental claim, you're back that was denied, and then they deny it again. What do you do? Well, I guess we should speak globally. So you file a supplemental claim, and that's where you're reopening an old claim, and then it's denied. Well, at that point, you have three options. You could go to the board, which we can talk about later. You can ask for what's called a higher level review, meaning that it goes up to another adjudicator in that regional office in, in the VA agency, or you can file supplemental claim. So Carol, where, where does that get the, get us if we file that supplemental claim? What is that and what's going well, the on? The supplemental there? claim, if we file that, which is the 0995, we have to we have to submit what they consider new and relevant evidence for them to consider it. Um, so you have three options. The, the, if and you and if you do that within a year, what's what's the incentive there? The incentive file. is getting your original effective date. But if you, if you want to go to the higher level review, uh, no additional evidence can be submitted. They will only consider the evidence that was before the VA when they made the decision on the 0995. So, so, that, so the, I guess the first thing that I'm not going to call it a red flag, but, but it's where somebody gets tripped up is, you know, you have a supplemental claim, which Carrie defined as vague at best as far as what it covers and what it doesn't. And then you are denied there, well, then you can file another supplemental claim. But there's a huge difference here because that second supplemental claim, you want to file within a year as if it were an appeal so that you could keep that original effective date. Exactly. If you don't file within a year, still a supplemental claim, but that effective date is gone. Right. So the other thing, Carol, you just led into was the higher level review. And there's no evidence. We are promised that it's a more seasoned adjudicator there. Um, and Carrie, what do you typically see come out of that? There's no new evidence. They're doing a full review. What, what, what is the decision you see if, if they see that there's error? The majority of the time, I will see the higher level review. Uh, if they're going to do anything that appears to be in our favor, <clears throat> uh, it's a duty. To, it's, they'll usually call a duty to assist error in the previous supplemental decision. 
uh, where they will say, uh, they'll tell the lower level they should have gotten a, a medical opinion or an exam or certain records. And so they will send it back to the supplemental claim lane. They will issue what's called a higher level review decision and they'll, and they'll just vaguely list it. We found a duty to assist error in your case and they send it back to the supplemental claim lane. The supplemental claim lane develops whatever the error is that the higher level review called out because keep in mind the higher level review is kind of like the old appeals teams at the RO. They now do no, don't, no development whatsoever. So if they see that something has to be developed, they send it back to the supplemental claim line. Those guys do the development. And the decision you get from that is a supplemental claim decision. It's not a higher level review. So you went from supplemental to higher level review back to supplemental. Now, right. you got, now you've got another choice to make. And then well, just oh, what, see, what so. do you see when you file the higher level review? Denials. I mean, I have been very, very disgusted about what we're getting. It doesn't, to me, it just looks like a stamp denial. And we're getting them all over the place. And I, I have decided that I'm probably never going to be filing those anymore. I'm just going to go to the board um, or get additional evidence to go to supplement. But basically, the board is the place that I think we need to go. So, I, I, Carol, I guess there's three things that could happen there, right? There's the stamp denial, which I agree is the majority of them. There's a grant. They actually give you benefits in, in some regard. Or there's the duty to assist error where they send it back to the, to the lower adjudicator. And, you know, I agree the grants are very rare. And the problem I see with the duty to assist errors is you can't appeal that. So if you right. see them say, oh, well, there, you guys should have gotten a medical exam. And our whole point is, well, medical evidence is there. We can't appeal that decision on saying there should have been an exam. We have to wait for the supplemental lane to make another decision to then appeal that where we want. As Carol said, we could do a supplemental claim. You know, we could do, uh, make another appeal. Uh, and what we've been finding is, is that we've not gotten a lot of, uh, we have not gotten the results we would have liked. No, we haven't. And unfortunately, they can take a lot. Sometimes they're fast, but sometimes they can take a year to make this stamp denial. Um, and when they, when they say, oh, there's development that should have been made, a lot of times it's because we have good, as you said, Matt, really good evidence in support of a veteran. The VA doesn't seem to have any evidence contrary to that. And that's when they want to go back and develop. So the whole process to me has been very discouraging. I, I really think the board is where people need to focus. And, and, and I will say that is very different from how we've practiced for the last exactly. decade and a half in that we tried to keep our cases in the regional office by if there was a, you know, we get a rating decision, we disagree, then we would file NOD up to a decision review officer. And again, this is in the legacy system because we found that if we got the new evidence or we got them evidence that proved the case from a legal and a medical standpoint, uh, we ended up getting really good results in our, our, desire has always been how can we get our veteran through the system fastest to get the result that they deserve and we found that that was very a very good lane it's very if you effective will. yeah it, it was and we had a lot of people at the va who knew what they were doing and you got them the right evidence and they were able to award the veteran but i'm not seeing that in the higher level review it's very very discouraging and it's a waste yeah. of time I, I would agree. I, you know, when, when I talked about the duty to assist errors earlier, that's probably what I see the most out of the higher level review. But what I see the least are, are grants, like you talked about. Uh, I, I, a couple, you know, one in 10, maybe in good cases. Uh, oh, I'm talking about much worse than that yeah. for us. And, and so, you know, I look at it like a maze now. It's, it's, it's they used to call it the hamster wheel. I think it's now yes. a maze and you, <laughs> Once you get into it, you can't get out. <laughs> Just uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, as an entry, no, uh, no exit. But I think the other thing y'all brought up is is even more important. Is I don't know how many appeals I file, and I get a letter from the VA saying this was not the right appeal. So uh -huh. it's even more of a maze. Uh, I disagree with them, but they they're the ones that control it, and you need to respond to their letters. Well, and I, and I think that's where we were originally going with the, with the topic of these uh, requests for application letters. Uh, do you want to get into that, Matt, or you want to you go on? No, I, th I think that's great because, it, you know, we laid out what happened in the legacy system and how mm -hmm. as far as it, it was 
mostly linear going up to the board, you know, the, the more appeals you had. This is, you can go up, you can go down, you can go sideways, you can go here, you can go to the board. Um, but in that process, they are making decisions on your case without notifying you they're making decisions on your case. And what I mean by that is when you get a rating decision, it shows you, hey, this is, we made a decision on your case and here's what it is. What Carol just alluded to and Carrie is gonna enlighten us further on is that they're sending letters that are making decisions on your case and you don't even appreciate that that could be closing your case out. And so, so Carrie, talk to us about uh, what, what you're seeing. So uh, I think I tried to allude to earlier that we, I started seeing these uh, initially when we were using 526s uh, to, to try to reopen a much older claim that hadn't been touched in you know 20 years. Uh, and this letter was uh, very short. It did not have appellate rights. Uh, typically the first paragraph in the letter is the only thing pertinent to what you've done in the case. Uh, it may be specific, it may be so vague you don't know what the heck VA is talking about, but it will generally tell you that you filed the wrong application one in one form or another, uh, and that VA will not take any further action on your case. From that point below, most of the letters I've seen are just are just boilerplate at that point. They'll they'll put graphs in there about you know if this then that. So you know if you if you receive this decision, this is the kind of form you filed. If this is what you want to do, this is the kind of form you file. None of that may be specific to your case, and you might not know that the letter actually closed out your claim. All right. Now, as we went forward, we started seeing, and now we're seeing them all over the place, um, and have been for the past six months or so. You know, for example, you file a supplemental claim on a proper supplemental claim form. Uh, it, it could be something as simple as you've got the the form correct. VA looks at it and just makes a silly mistake, thinking it's for a different decision that's. 10 years old and they send you mm -hmm. some letter saying, uh, sorry, we can't do this. And, but you don't really know that you've made a mistake because you didn't, they did. <laughs> uh, and they closed your case out because of it. Um, a, a, a good example is uh, you request a higher level review. And I've seen this a number of times already. You request a higher level review, the higher level review comes out and they find a duty to assist error. They send it back to the supplemental claim lane. They develop whatever the higher level review told them to, they make another decision, which is from the supplemental claim lane. Right. So your last decision there is a supplemental claim decision. You can then come back and request another higher level review. You cannot do a higher level review immediately after a higher level review. And I've seen lots of letters in that very scenario saying, sorry, we, you can't do a higher level review after a higher level review. Uh, we will not take any further action on your claim. Here are the forms you need. Or you know, and to say, and they won't attach the forms; they'll just spell them out in the in the letter. Well, that's incorrect because the last decision was not a higher level review decision; it was a supplemental claim decision. You know, and apart from the five two six issue on the old claims, every one of these that I've seen have been incorrect in some form or fashion. Uh, and the VA has corrected them, but that was only after we had to reach out to. You know, somebody in VA, and I say somebody, VA's what, Matt, 20,000 people in VBA now? Uh, right. and, and it's a maze. You don't know who to reach out to um, unless you're in this business every day. And a lot of times we don't know how to reach, who to reach out to. Uh, but the letter doesn't give you appellate rights. And you may think your claim is pending, and, and they closed it. Right. No. You get and letters that the say, you, you, you filed the improper form. Please file the correct yeah. form. You don't and, know why you didn't file it, yeah. but your case is over. If you don't do right. something, it's gone. And that's what they don't really tell you. Yeah. And they, they are making a lot of mistakes on those letters. Uh, yes. And I, I mean, I've seen, I've said it before in other, other forms, I've probably seen them in 25 to 30% of my cases, uh, you know, and that's less than a hundred cases. All right. Uh, not to get into how many cases, but, the point is, when you extrapolate that out to every veteran in the country, uh, the, there has to be tens to hundreds of thousands of claims closed out there that are not going to get opened back up unless somebody takes action and that you don't know to take. That's, that's, the, the, and that's one of the reasons okay. that I, I want to go to the board. 
I've, I've had so, I spend so much time responding to these letters that I could go to the board and get a decision before we finally get the VA to do what they're supposed to do at the regional office. It's a serious problem. And the board route is cleaner. If you look at it from a number of forms, you, know, you reopen exactly. a claim, supplemental claim, or you have to file that 526. And then if you're denied, you just file the, the board appeal, which uh, has its own name, but also just to be more confusing is they label it a notice of disagreement or an NOD, which again, if you remember the legacy system, you had to file an NOD, but that did not get you right to the board. So, but that, that aside, the, the, the name of it aside, it does shoot you up to the board and then you have to decide where to go in the board. But and I think it's important to talk about your three choices at the board too, Matt. It is, uh, yeah, and it's, it's a kind of similar thing. Once you get up to what you think is a straight line, there comes three other lines. And so Carol, what, so the three so choices the are. Chance, three choices, right. You can go direct appeal. That means you add no additional evidence. They're just gonna look at what's in the file or you have 90 days to submit additional evidence and they mean 90 days, they will not give you a continuance, right. no matter what, whether there's a COVID violet, vi uh, virus or what. So you're really stuck on that 90 days. Or the third one is you request that you have a hearing and be allowed to submit evidence. So you have three choices. And they want to incentivize the direct review, the direct review and then even to a smaller extent, the evidential review and they want nothing to do with hearings. They've been trying to exactly. get rid of their hearing backlogs for decades. And so they tell their statement is that the direct review cases will be handled the fastest. They want those uh, ideally within under a year. And then the evidentiary cases will be handled a little bit uh, more slowly. Um, so you have to decide once you get up there, what positions your case in. Did you, were you able to put all the evidence you wanted into the file when you put that supplemental claim in? or did they go out and get a medical decision, a CMP exam from one of their doctors saying, you know, basically saying your case does not meet the standard or for a higher rating or service connection, which would pretty much mean you would need to get another opinion. If that's the case, then going you know, direct is probably not the best for you, but. I think that's I would, important to explain that because I think most people would think a direct review would mean I can't submit any evidence after I file for a direct review. That's really not the way it works, right? That you can't submit any evidence after a direct review? Say you've had a supplemental claim. Yeah. Then you put additional evidence after the supplemental claim, and now you want to go to the board. If you file a direct review, is the board going to look at the evidence that came in after the supplemental claim? Say in the supplemental claim, there was evidence against your client, and you obtained additional evidence very favorable, and now you want to go to the board. Can you go to the direct review, and they consider that evidence? Right. So what, what, what you're talking about, Carol, then is the, you know, with each of these decisions, you have a year. So you get the supplemental claim and that, that's the, that claim was decided on all the evidence put before it. If you then put evidence after that, meaning new evidence that you think supports your claim and you want to go in the direct review claim, they actually will not consider that evidence. Exactly. So. And I think, I think that is a trap because anyone would think they're going to look at the evidence that's already sitting there. So I really want everybody to know they're not. They're only going to look at the evidence that was before the person who made the decision, whether it's a supplemental or the higher level review, the last decision, that's the last evidence they will look at. I think it might be important too to add that when there is extra evidence in there, whether it's uh, at the board, but especially at the regional office when you're doing a higher level review, because uh, I've seen this numerous times, they will issue a decision saying there has been evidence submitted after the rating decision that they can't review. They won't tell you what that evidence is. Right. Uh, I've had plenty of cases where I, I look at the case realizing we haven't submitted new evidence. Why are they telling us there's exactly. new evidence in the file that they won't consider and not telling us what it is? And, and you just left scratching your head. It, whether they, they did they leave that in there from a previous decision, uh, just to get to take it out, uh, or and, or, did, or is there new evidence in the file you don't you're not aware of? And Carrie, the other thing about it, the board has gotten so that they before they pretty much went through all the evidence that was before them, they're not doing that anymore. So they will refer. They may have a bunch of evidence in the file that they never refer to. Yeah. So you really don't know what was there when they made the decision, which yeah. leaves you unsure what you should do. 
Well, I mean, you know, the sad part about all of this is, and, and uh, you know, this is just my opinion where uh, opinions go, but, you know, what, but it goes back to the time I was in VA more than a decade ago. VA has been wanting to close the record on veterans for a long time. Uh, and that's what they got out of this AMA. You know, you've got a, a, not completely, obviously, as we've just discussed, but they wanted that closed record from that first decision, uh, which is what you have in the HLR process and part of the board process. Uh, and, you know, I, I think they almost sold their soul to get that closed record and part of the process that ended up just uh, it's raking veterans over the, over the coals left and right. Right. So if you pick the direct review, you need to realize no evidence submitted after the last decision was made is going to be considered. I, that's, I wish they would warn veterans, but they really don't. Yeah. And so our firm, I mean, we, we are constantly evaluating what's the best way to get our vets the benefits as fast as possible, but, but not you know, get a denial faster. And so we have been doing the BVA with evidence lane. And the beauty there, you know, they say you have 90 days to get the evidence in, but you also have a year to appeal that prior decision. So if you figure out what evidence you need, you get that appeal in, and hopefully that evidence in at the same time, then you've got what you need at the board. But we're really hesitant to file the 90 days unless we have that evidence ready to submit. Because like I said, they're not going to grant you a continuance. So in cases where we get veterans that are up against the year appeal date and we have to file an appeal, then I'm choosing the hearing and the evidence lane. And then once I get the evidence, because there's no time limit on the evidence, uh, and once I get that evidence in, then I waive the hearing and ask them to make a decision based on the evidence in the file. But that's the only way that I can be sure that I get the evidence in uh, timely. If, if I only have 90 days and, and I don't get it in, then that's a real problem. Yeah. Let me ask, and, and you may not want to get into this topic, so just tell me to shut up if not. Uh, are you seeing the, uh, the, the, whether it be the board or um, uh, the local level, uh, adhering to their promise on effective dates in the AMA process? Oh, no, not at all. It, it is a mess. I will get board decisions back, and these decisions may have been depend, uh, pending for six years, and they give an effective date of, now, it makes no rhyme or reason. And they seem to be doing that more and more often. Instead of going back to 2014 when the original claim was filed and it's been continuously appealed, they will pick, say the decision just came out July 20th, 2020. Yeah, I'm or, saying or, or, or Carol, this I mean, is the I, regional office, not the board, the regional office. I, I say think the, the board grants service connection for PTSD and they have to give it an effective date. The regional office is giving them the date that they're making the decision almost. So, so the thing that I'm seeing more frequent, because that, that's an older case that's been in the system for a while, but cases where the veteran, let's say, filed a, uh, filed a supplemental claim to reopen a back injury last year, they get denied. And then within a year, they file a new supplemental claim with new and relevant evidence. And the VA comes in and says, oh, okay, we'll grant this, but they grant it the day of the second application or the date of the outside of it medical opinion or CMP exam. So the effective dates are just wildly off. You know, the whole promise of this new system to the veteran was, here's a faster way, here's yeah. more decisions, but you can keep your effective date. And as Carol says, whether it's coming back from BBA or it's just in the same adjudicator's hands probably, and that they denied once and they grant the second time, they're not following the law. No. And effective no. dates is where they keep their money. You know, if they, if they realize they have to grant your case, and they chop you at the knees on the effective dates, you can't go back and fight them on that after a year. So that's something you really gotta be concerned You wanna appeal right away. Well, the CMP exam is the date they like to pick it. They like to pick them, they have a recent CMP, CMP compensation and pension exam, and then they pick that as the date of the effective date of this problem starting. So that needs to be oh. appealed, that should be appealed. And, and I don't know that people know they can do that. Because oh, it will say, say the board gives you, um, service connection for PTSD, but they don't say how much because they can't, they have, there was no rating, so they can't review that and they don't say the effective date. So the regional office gets to pick the rating decision and uh, amount and the effective date. But when they do the decision, it says, 
we are implementing the grant from the BDA, which makes it seem like this decision was made by the board, not by the regional office. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that from both of you because I, and, you know, one of the reason I asked the question is I have not, especially in the, in the, in the scenario that Matt put forth, you know, you do a supplemental claim, come back and do, give them more evidence and, and, and do another claim. I have not seen a single decision yet and it's since the AMA has come out where they've applied the effective date the way they promised the world they were going to do it. Not a single one. And I just think that it's horrendous. Uh, it man. really is. It was a, it's not, they, I, they told us, I wonder if they're going to come to Nova and talk about it because they promised that that was the whole part of going to this new system. And it's, it's well, right, right. It, it was the trade-off and that, that they can close the records, yeah. the record in some points. And, uh, but the veteran would have a chance to keep his effective date alive by bringing in more evidence and, and, and appealing or, you know, picking a lane within a year. And that is, that is a problem that's come out. Right. One, one more thing, and this is kind of circling back to the higher level review, is I do believe there are times to use that. One of the things that any rating decision the VA now publishes has to give you is what's called favorable findings of fact. And those findings have to relate to what's at issue. So if a veteran is applying for PTSD, they're not service connected. Uh, the VA has three things, we'll keep it just to three things they have to show or have to evaluate. Does the veteran have a diagnosis of PTSD? Was there a stressor that can be shown with evidence outside of the veteran story itself? And then is there a nexus or a link between the two. Uh, the VA now, they can't just deny the vet, say, no, you, you're denied because you don't have this. They can deny still, but they can deny, and they, but they have to evaluate what does the veteran have. So they can say, you don't have service-connected PTSD. However, you have a diagnosis of PTSD. And something did happen to you in service. We have verified that. But our doctor said, you have a personality disorder or something like that that was actually related to what happened in service. So they have to give you findings that show you what, what did happen in service or, or what, what, what of that issue you have proven. And so why I say higher level review can be useful is a lot of times the supplemental claim level, they just won't do this. They, they, they won't give you any findings. And the beauty of these findings, once you have them, is they lock the VA into them. The VA can't just shrug them off. When I say the VA, I mean both the regional office level and the board. So sometimes it is worth appealing to a higher level review with the sole purpose of saying, I want you to tell me what my favorable findings of fact are. What, you know, what have I proven? What do I need to go show? You know, is that worth in every case? No, but in a case like uh, PTSD in particular, where stressors can be very difficult to prove, if you get a favorable finding of fact saying, we concede your stressor, well, that's a big thing you don't have to worry about. Now you've got to develop medical evidence on the actual PTSD itself. You have the diagnosis and then evidence on it being related to service. So that's something to consider. You know, we, we are jaded a bit right now with uh, what we've seen because we, you know, we don't take cases that don't have merit to them. We take cases that the VA should have granted. And so to see so few uh, that actually are granted at that level is, is, a, is a big disappointment. That being said, there still is a use for that in the system. All right, and with that, we sure appreciate you coming to see us uh, at the Hill and Pond video blog, and please stay tuned on this space for more to come.